All right, we are live. Everyone, today we have John Hervey joining us, the force behind uh, classics such as Black Tiger. Uh, he's here to talk about his newest Indiegogo, Magna, The Last Pantheon, Volume 1. And right. hopefully we'll we'll get a little bit more background as we go, too. Um, however, people always watch at the beginning and then drop off somewhere else. So let's start <laughs> with your let's start with the, the newest campaign. Tell us about Magna, the last pantheon. Awesome. And thank you for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Yeah. You know, Magna is it's in the same world as Black Tiger for those that back Black Tiger. Um, but it takes place in, in a little bit of a different time period. Uh, so this is a story of a uh, protagonist who's um, lived a pretty provincial life, and she's been, uh, you know, kind of by the edict of her parents, been suppressing her her own powers. Uh, but then um, a beast comes knocking, and she actually uses her powers to save her her family. And in the process of that, she learns some truths. Uh, she learns uh, from her family that she's actually uh, adopted, and this sends her on a um, basically on an adventure of self-discovery. It's in 1942, so World War II is afoot at this time. Uh, and she's in a fictitious city called Tree City, Idaho. She mm -hmm. actually ventures to Finland. And uh, in the midst of trying to learn some things about herself, she finds herself uh, in the midst of a, a skirmish between Finnish and Russian force forces. And um, then finds herself in the midst of a conglomeration of the last of the mighty men of old. So you have uh, Pantheon members from the Egyptian Pantheon, from the Aesir, which is uh, Asgardian, uh, Olympian, and Chinese Pantheons that are all band together for survival. Now she finds herself in the midst of their struggle. Um, and as she learns more about herself, she finds herself a linchpin, um, you know, as to kind of the outcome of this struggle. And this, this is the first 75 pages of a 150-page adventure. Um, production on all 150 pages are completed. Wow. So, you know, there's no, uh, you know, people will get their book, you know, <laughs> whether, whether anybody else backs or not, those that have backed will, will get their, will get their book because the book is produced. Well, it looks like you've already had some success. Uh, the initial campaign was for $5,000, which, uh, at the time of this recording, it looks like you are up to 62.75. So, Clearly, you have enough fans to back the original, uh, and then you extended it for another. We've got another fifteen days. That's left. right. That's so, right. Um. So. Uh. <laughs> sorry. No, you're good. So, so um. The the beast. Yes. That comes yes. out. Which, by the way, I I love this image right here. <laughs> That's it. Great camera work. Uh, I I often complain about color <laughs> on yeah. this channel, but no, this is fantastic. I can clearly see who's where and what's what. Uh, this is excellent. Uh, All right. So the the beast. Tell us a little bit about uh, why they come for her now. Like, okay. What's the so um, and you'll find throughout the you'll find throughout this first seventy five pages that. Um, they've, um, the, they have been looking for her, uh, since she was a baby. Um, so you'll, you'll see a story of how, um, her adoptive parents found her, um, and how they escaped this beast, this beast once before. Oh. So, and that's part of the, that's a big part of the reason why they left Finland and came to them, came to America was, um, you know, kind of, uh, keeping her, uh, tucked away and safe. So um, a, a lot of what kind of you start to unravel in this story, it, it's really, it's her hero's journey, but it's also her journey of self-discovery and finding out, you know, who she is and then finding out, you know, kind of a, you know, kind of her destiny, so to speak. Um, and uh, this takes place during World War II, correct? It does. Yes. Yes, it does. Okay, and does the the war itself factor into this? So the war factors in marginally into this particular story, but um, in, in in future um, 
you know, it, it seems like we're gaining enough tra traction to do more stories. In future stories, it will play a much bigger part. Ah, oh, I see. And, you know, I won't lie. I, <clears throat> I love the opportunity to mash up things in comics. Mm -hmm. And I got to mash up a couple of things that I love. Um, you know, from a historical standpoint, you know, World War II was an amazing and horrific time. And uh, just kind of being able to play with that, uh, you know, along with mythology, which uh, has has been um, a big interest of mine since I was since I was very small. So just playing with all these different elements, and then of course the superhero element, because I mean, what's better than that? There's nothing better than that. Of course. Uh, so speaking of mythology, um, you know, after reading uh, the the Black Tiger, yes. Um, one that you had uh, the well, I think it was all six issues collected. And That's then, correct. And seeing the mythology here, it seems like you're like you don't necessarily have one big focus, but you seem to be interested in myths of all sorts. Well, I definitely, you know, I, I wanted to be able to bring um, these um, these different myths together, um, kind of coherently in one world. Um, so, I, so that definitely is something that I've done uh, purposefully, um, and I'm thank you first and foremost for backing Black Tiger. And you're going to see a lot more of the unraveling of the mythos behind Black Tiger in the upcoming campaigns as well. Um, so, uh, you know, you're going to be learning more about um, Black Tiger. Um, you know, during the time of this story in 1942, there is a Black Tiger. Not the Black Tiger, not the current Black Tiger from the volume that you read, mm -hmm. but Black Tiger is really a mantle that is passed down over time. So there is a Black Tiger that's in existence at this time, and as 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 things kind of move forward, uh, we'll see we'll see uh, kind of the integration of of uh, kind of Black Tiger and, and Magna and and kind of their mythos. So I'm I'm I have some fun plans. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, you know, one thing in Black Tiger that I noticed is you you use the term uh, metahumans. So there seems to be an acknowledgement in the overall world that there are some people with powers. I don't know how prevalent they were, but in the, in the time of Magna, is that also the case or is it more underground at this point? Well, it's 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 more underground at this point. So you're really you're really getting the opportunity to see some of the origins of the metahumans that you'll be seeing more of in the next Black Tiger volume. So it is all intertwined. It is all interrelated. Um, so y you can read both and enjoy both without reading one of the others, but you get a much more complete picture of the world if you're able to you know, get your hands on both Black Tiger and on Magna. Because some of the overarching items, like the, the metahumans, um, there is there is a common um, there is a common source, so to speak, oh, uh, for the metahumans. And that's uh, part of what is being unraveled. Um, not so much directly in this story, but then I'll be able to start pointing back to some of the things, um, especially with this next volume of Black Tiger, uh, that we'll be releasing. We're really starting to delve more into uh, the origins of the metahumans in the current society. Oh, very cool. All right, so let's, uh, uh, before we get back into it, uh, let's go quickly over your the different campaign uh, levels. Yes, sir. So starting up, we have, uh, oh man. Mar Marcio Abreu. Commission. Sorry, yeah. I'm terrible with names. No, he's he's a he's a Marcio Abreu is a he's a he's an outstanding dude and an amazing artist. And uh, what he's what he has agreed to provide at a very reasonable cost is, uh, along with getting a copy of the book, he will do an eight by ten bust up drawing of any character of your choosing. So I know for a lot of folks in in the community, they have characters of their own. Um, so I, I know you know. I'm not trying to dox any folks, but I know some of the folks that did this, they're getting their own character. Oh, nice. So basically, if you provide him with references, he'll do a bust up of your of, of a character that maybe belongs to you, or he can do any of the cool standard characters too as well. Um, so that is the that's the feature perk, and there's three more of those remaining. 
Um, I don't, I don't think those are going to last because it's a pretty cool perk and he priced it at a, at a very, you know, I mean, you can kind of see the red selling that he did. So you get an idea of the, of the level of quality, you know, that he's going to provide. Oh yeah. That's yeah. I mean that that's very much in the traditional comic book vein. So it's not like a, you know, a quick five minute sketch or something. No, no, this is a, you know, this is pencils and inks, you know, so, you know, he's, it's, it's a real, it's a real, you know, commission that he's providing folks, you know, a high quality commission. And that's, you know, that's what we all, that's what we all love. <laughs> you, you know, you know, one, one of the things in just putting the, in putting the uh, rewards together, I just really tried to think of, you know, what would I want at the end of the day? Yes. You know, as, as a comic book reader, and I know that I don't represent everybody, but it's like, as a comic book reader, I mean, I want the comics, of course. Yeah. And, you know, if I want some other stuff, I want it to be good quality. You know, like, you know, I, if, I, if I can get like an awesome commission, um, you know, from, from an artist that I think that is awesome, I love that. Um, so those are kind of the elements I try to bring to the table. You know, you know I think uh, the covers are pretty nice. So I know some folks wanted, you know, would like posters, you know, for the covers. So I was, I was trying to do stuff like that. That's cool. You know, the the upgrade offerings on a lot of campaigns have often confused me. Um, not to say that, uh, you know, I'm not the arbiter of what's good and what's bad. Yeah. Um, but there are certain things that I don't understand the appeal of. Uh, but other people seem to love, like not to throw shade on anyone, but there's yeah. a lot of like pins that get made and a lot of patches. And for me, I just have a drawer of pins and patches now. Uh, I, that's what I literally have. And I know, and like, I'm, I agree with you. And this is my main question. You, and you tell me this as well. And I, then I'll tell you my answer. Do those things compel you to buy a project? Have you ever, have you ever been on the fence about a project and said like, this pin has put me over the edge. I'm now going to buy, I'm now going to back this project because of this pin or because of this patch. No, never. Me neither. And I don't know if you and I are just outliers, but it's just like, you know, and, and that's one of the things you'll see on my campaign. And maybe it's a struggle. I'm not really pushing any any stretch goals because I just really tried to offer people what I thought was cool. And then, you know, I I could I could do some stretch goals, you know, I could I could provide some other stuff, you know, could definitely provide, you know, maybe a bookmark or some other stuff. Man, I like bookmarks, but I have so many bookmarks now, dude. Yeah, well, it's funny because <laughs> when you asked me that question, uh, I think the only thing that I've gotten from a campaign is um, I backed Allegiance Arts, uh, not Red Rooster, but the with the other three books um, mm -hmm. when they had that one. It came with a bookmark, which I do use on occasion, and it's nice. And that's the only thing that I use. Yeah. But for me, when I think about stuff like, I don't know if you remember... Man, it must have been around 93 or 94. Marvel came out with a big 11 by 17 book of Jim Lee covers. Yes, sir. They had like that would, you know, I would buy something for that. But in general, for me, yeah. I, I have to say, um, you know, just of my opinion, I want more book, right? Yeah. So there's yeah. certain things like... Um, for example, Ryan Wynn in his Hammerella campaign now. Yeah. He's adding in um there was an original Gods and Gears, I guess you say like trailer or preview that was in it came out on a Wednesday, which is what originally got me to buy to buy into Gods and Gears. And he's including <clears throat> that with Hammerella. Um one yeah. of the reasons I bought Black Tiger was because it, it you know, I saw a tweet from you that said it was like 172, 176 pages yeah. somewhere yeah. around there. And I was like, holy crap, you know, even even if it ends up not being very good, it's 172 pages of not very good as opposed to like 60 that most people put out. Like, I'll right. take a chance on that. Right. Right. And I, I have I, I'm of the same mindset as you. You know, it's like, what do I really want? I want comic and I want more of the comic. And that's appealing to me. And I, 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 I too have backed Camarilla, and I've been happy that more people have been backing and it's been hitting stretch goals. So I'm like, yeah, more book, awesome. The more the better. <laughs> yeah. 
that's you know that that's kind of like what I would like to see in in upgrade or not upgrade stretch goals myself. Like, how about yeah. like a five page backup story or mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. a little bit more background about one of the characters or yeah you know, history of the world or something that or that's know, a good idea posters. Um, one thing I I often don't understand too is uh, the the multiple covers from different artists. Um, especially if it's a book from an artist, like if I'm getting um, a book from, uh, you know, John Malin or Art T. Bear, like I'm buying it because I want their art. I right. don't necessarily want somebody else's cover on their art. Mm, like, I gotcha. Like, you know, is that poster from somebody else doing it? Ah. That would be cool for me. Okay. That makes good sense. But um, That makes good sense. That's just my thought, but you know, a lot of people love the knickknacks. I don't know what you do with them. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I pretty much get the pretty much bare bones packages, and I still have yeah. a ton of knickknacks. I mean, I get the books, you know. So, but I still have a, a ton of patches and stickers and uh, and bookmarks. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And then, then I kind of don't have the heart to throw them out because it's like, oh man, somebody you know somebody. put effort into these. And, yeah. It looked cool, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I think we're all learning, and I'm still learning too. I know there's things I could do better on this campaign. I think that's the thing that's kind of cool about what we're doing right now. It's like, you know, it's really revolutionizing the industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and for me, at the end of the day, I ha I guess you, I, I want people to enjoy the books, and yeah. I don't mind. I don't mind if my sales numbers are a little bit lower, but it's people that are buying books as opposed to tchotchkes and really enjoying the books. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I don't, if, if I have big sales numbers and it's not the books, that seems a little bit counterproductive. Maybe I'm missing the boat, you know, maybe, you know, cause I, I realize merchandising is an important thing, you know, but, oh, yeah. but I'm, I'm just old school. I love, I love comic books. I, that's my first and foremost is the medium I've loved most. So the reason, you know, kind of with this whole thing with CG and this whole Renaissance, I'm, all for it and i'm buying so many books mm -hmm. um you know i've got so many now i got books that my books got books right now you know i've, I've opened up and i opened up a number of them and i was hoping to get them at least get caught up before the holidays ended i didn't get caught up all the way but i did read some um <laughs> yeah. but I, i'm excited i'm excited for the uh you know for this whole movement like it was kind of cool like with um was a six gun gorilla Oh yeah, yeah. I finally, so time. like that was great, and you know, literally, all I got was a book. That's all I wanted. You know, yep. open it up, got the book. You know, got to read it, and I was super happy. <laughs> no, I need I more of it now because it left me on a kind of a cliffhanger. But yeah. Uh, so as a producer, let, let me ask you something about that. So you have these books already produced, uh, Magna. So people don't necessarily have to worry about if they're going to get it or not. Um, I bought the Six Gun Gorilla compilation. So it's several books together. That's now, what I bought. I, I kind of wonder if the industry is sort of shifting. Like it's, let's say, 2018 when we really started to see uh, a, a larger creative move, indie movement take off. Yeah. Um, a lot of the books were smaller. A lot of the books were somewhere between 40 and 60 pages. Yeah. But now, to, to me at least, I really prefer the larger books with a more complete story. I mean, some of those smaller stories were okay, but it's like, here's the setup, you know, and we don't get to any meat. That's right. Um, so do you uh, – oh, and sorry, getting back to Six Gun Gorilla, um, I had made a video about it. And the author, uh, Brian, he had, or I said in the video, uh, oh, well, I think I'll wait until the next compilation before I get more. And then he had left a comment where he said, well, then there won't be a next compilation if nobody buys the next issue. So I'm kind of wondering, as a creator, mm -hmm. are we getting to the point where fans are expecting a larger book, like more volume for... Um, a standard, let's say, $25, $30 uh, 
uh, campaign? I mean, personally, I kind of am. And this is my rationale. I mean, you know, if you get a 20 to 30 page book and it's not coming out with any kind of periodicity, I mean, it's like it's you can get a 22 page comic knowing you're going to get the next issue next month. But if you're getting 22 pages and you're not going to get the next 22 pages or 24 pages for half a year or a year, you know, you're, you've only got beats. You've only got a couple of beats mm -hmm. at most in the story, you know, and it's, it's, I feel like we need to deliver more, you know, and, and as, as somebody that's consuming content, I'd like to get more. I totally understand the production challenges. I get it. It's not, it's not free. It's not, cheap to do that but i think that's i think that is the balance of not getting books as often is that you got to provide more than you know 40 pages of story you got to get people down the road on a story and yeah. get them to a place where okay i'm good to come back as opposed to man all they did was introduce a number of characters mm -hmm. and that was it <laughs> you know didn't even get to the call to action just, just introduce stuff, you know, and I got to wait six months or a year for the next couple of beats. And it's like, oh man, you know, that kinda, that's kind of tough. Yeah, that, that's one thing I, that I've noticed too, and uh, not to throw shade on people, but there seems to be a little bit less story discipline. Um, if you go back to, let's say, the 1980s and Marvel and DC, almost all of the issues had a, a full arc that was contained within 22 pages. Now, mm -hmm. there might be a larger story that it's part of, but each 22-page book had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Right. Whereas, you know, like you're saying, we're, we're only getting act one. We're only getting the introduction to things. Yeah. And I think it's, I think it's just a different um, – it's just a different writing structure that people are using now. You know, people are – you know, and, and just, just the same way the TV has changed, the comics have changed. I mean, you remember back in the day, if you watched a show, you could watch an episode. Yes. And you'd be good. Like, I used to watch Hunter. If, if, oh. I, if I missed a week, I could still pick up and watch the and, and I can catch that one whenever it reruns, the one that I missed. Mm -hmm. Because the story was always self-contained. It's going to be Hunter and Dee Dee, and they're going to be doing their thing, and they're going to catch the bad guy. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have fun. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to enjoy it. Now, now it's much more seasonal. So it's like, okay, well, there is an overarching, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a red thread that runs through the whole season or that mm -hmm. runs through all six issues and you're trying to get that villain or you're trying. So it makes it much more, um, you can't jump in in the middle anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, I feel kind of both ways about that. I mean, that was actually one of the reasons why with Black Tiger, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to deliver all 172 pages in one volume because I'm like, nobody knows me from Adam. You know, <laughs> I don't want to deliver half a story and the people just be like, okay, and how long till this clown gives me the half of this story? I want to show people that I can deliver a full story and I can mm -hmm. complete, a, I can give them a full story arc so that like, you know what? I'm cutting it in half with Magna, but, but I'm going to give you a full story arc. I'm right. going to give you a button at the end. I'm not going to leave you hanging. So mm -hmm. I think that I, honestly, I think it's, I think it's a challenge that um, yeah. kind of as we, as, as we kind of continue to, you know, as the delivery of books kind of continues and as, as the um, industry continues to, to, to change um, that we're going to see, uh, hopefully, hopefully for the better, hopefully we're going to see that this is a, this is something that, creators and artists get on board with and um you know deliver in a way that is that works you know for uh for readers but i agree with you 100 percent. you know you can't um you can't write stories um where you don't give your audience any form of reward um yeah. and and then not give the next volume for another year <laughs> yeah i think that's a tough ask and uh, I'm kind of curious as we go along, you know, how many books will sort of go by the wayside where you had a halfway decent first campaign and then not a lot of return. Yeah. Um, but do you think that because now we're, you know, like we're saying maybe people need to have more 
uh, pages. Do you think that's going to be a barrier uh, or a large barrier to entry for a lot of people who want to get into comics but who haven't had the chance? Ah, man, you know, that's a good question. Um, you know, I'm seeing I'm seeing a number of folks that are um, that are bringing out some good books, some high quality books. And some of these books are longer. You know, this is but I think this is I think this is what it comes down to. What it comes down to is making a book is it's a risk. Mm -hmm. But the consumer can't bear that risk. You know, the yeah. risk, you know. At the end of the day, as producers, we need to make the book. Um, we need to get the book into people's hands. One of the biggest things we've seen is that if the books don't get into people's hands, it destroys everybody's confidence in what we're doing. So I agree. You know, it's a challenge in that if you're producing 22 pages, you know, you're doubling your budget, you're producing 40 or 50 pages. It's it's much more onerous. Agreed, you know, on the on the creator of the book. Um, unless you're known, I think it's a tough ask to have your readers bear all that risk. Some people, I think, in the past, people have been able to do it, where basically the book hasn't even been started from an artistic standpoint, and they'll throw up, they'll put up their campaign, and then people will start backing. Unfortunately, some people have been burned that way. Yeah. So now, now what I think was done in goodwill, people aren't as willing to do anymore. So it's like, okay, you have a 50 page book. You don't have to have the book completed, but you need to show enough uh, proof of concept and artwork that people mm -hmm. feel comfortable that, yeah, this book is getting done. Yeah, I, I have to totally agree with you on that. I mean, uh, yeah, there are there were a lot of people and there are a lot of people who I see, you know, they have mailing lists and they have like three images, which may or may not be actual pages. Right. Uh, it, it seems to me like you have to you have to have a lot more like now, since I have a lot of options in the market, you know, I need to see that. OK, this is going somewhere that I'm going to enjoy. Yes, yeah, I think so. And I think I think it's very fair. I think it's very fair for readers to. Uh, to expect that and to man and to demand that because at the end of the day, people are spending their hard earned dollars on whatever the product is. Um, mm -hmm. Like you said, like when you picked up black tiger, you know, your risk was maybe I'm going to buy it and I'm not going to like it. It's going to suck, mm -hmm. you know, but your risk can't be, I mean, I get this book. That's, that's not an acceptable risk as a consumer, uh, you know, yeah. And when we, we have to take, we have to make sure we're, we're taking that out of the equation as much as possible. Otherwise what it does, cause I've seen some, I've seen some uh, people streams and they're talking about, you know, why, you know, why I would never back a crowdfunded book. Mm -hmm. And it's based on maybe one or two people that didn't deliver, you know, but, but it has a real impact. You know, it has a real impact when people don't deliver on books. And I see what Jim Cox is saying because Man, I need to go back because um, I was looking through and I have, I, unfortunately, I have a lot of undelivered books so far. I think they're going to get delivered. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm not concerned so much about that. A couple of them I know are not. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is that is what it is. Yeah, um, yeah. But I think that's the risk that if we want more and more people to join this movement, especially as consumers, that we got to take out. You know, people shouldn't people shouldn't feel the risk of, is my book going to get delivered? And um, people shouldn't bear the risk, the production risk, so to speak. Right. You know, there. This has been an uh, this has been an extraordinary year in a funky way. In that, yeah, even with Black Tiger, the production was done on time, but like printing things got all messed up. So we ended up delivering later than we wanted to because of printing. Mm -hmm. But people knew the books were done. Right. You yeah. know. I mean, to me, that seems like the big thing. Um, you know, I, I go back and, uh, I look at like 2000, 2018, 2019, uh, especially with guys like Ethan Van Skyver, you know, all the spotlights were on him and the book was a year, his cyber frog book was a year late, but every week I could see streams of him drawing, you know, it seems like nobody who was really that interested in buying the book in the first place was that upset. 
because most people were like, oh, oh, that's the kind of quality you're going to put into it. Oh, yeah. okay. We'll wait for that. We'll wait for that. And, and it seems to me, um, you know, the lesson everybody else should take from that is if you're going to be late, you know, okay, things happen, but, uh, like in math, you got to show your work. Yeah. You got to let people know like, Hey, this is a new page. I just got back from the artist. Or if you are the artist, you know, Oh, here's the pencils for this. And yeah, be know. communicative. That's yeah. it. That's it. And like with EVS, the thing we got to realize too, that he's got a target on his back. Oh, so you course. have a whole bunch of people and this is, this is actually the very same thing that I think the big two suffer from. You have a whole bunch of people that are not comic book. Um, they're not, they're not interested in comics. They don't buy comics. They've got their own thing going on that are, you know, kind of putting their stuff in the Kool-Aid. They're That's saying, Hey, this guy is blah, blah, blah. But you know what? The people that bought the book are fine. And yeah. it's the same thing that DC and Marvel have suffered from. All these people that don't buy books have impacted what they're making. And guess what? You got just what you wanted. You, you changed yeah. your books and the people that don't buy books now are your only audience. Yeah, the whole Marvel and DC thing has really confused me because to an extent, um, the the idea of, well, we're going to go after these communities who are not traditional comic book buyers is not necessarily bad because if you look at comics before the 80s, you had superhero, of course, but you had horror, you had mystery. There was yes. a lot of romance comics. Women loved yeah. it. And if you look at like Japanese manga, they still have all these different genres. Um, part of the downfall of American comics really starts in in one of the golden ages, which is the 80s, when almost everything got consolidated down yeah. into superhero stuff. So mm -hmm. trying to, you know, go back to a more diverse type of book makes sense to me. The yeah. thing that doesn't make sense is why would you throw out the, the consumers that you already have? You know, it, like yeah. some of these books, if you were writing – you know, X-Men and Avengers and a lot of those books in a more traditional way, you could absolutely have room for more niche books, like even some of the more political ones or, yeah. uh, you know, the, I don't know, the weird She-Hulk, Hellcat, uh, watching YouTube, eating at food trucks every, every episode. <laughs> Like, you know, you could have that alongside the others, but why replace the thing that you know is a moneymaker with something that nobody has money for? Yeah. Now I've I've got I've got no answers for that because I mean I and they seem to be doing it across media, you know. So yeah. I, I have I really have no answers for that. I'll, one of the things that's interesting about the comic book industry with the consolidation of into just superhero comics, that went hand in hand with the consolidation of distribution. Right, you know, basically when um, when Diamond became the monopoly, mm -hmm. and because there were there were many other distributors before then, you know, then all of a sudden you just kind of got it was like a funnel, you know, all you've got now are just you know the superhero books that and because like you said Marvel and DC they were putting out other books too like I remember I used to get like All Out War and all these mm -hmm. other kind of cool books, you know, yeah, that, but all that stuff has gone by the wayside. Sure. I mean, even if you look to the early eighties, some of Marvel's bigger books, uh, GI Joe and transformers were always in the top 10 in the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, you had the star Wars books were quite popular for a while. Conan, the barbarian, he had two or three series at different times. Yep. Um, but yeah, you know, and it's interesting. You, you mentioned the distribution thing because somebody who's smarter than me, will one day look at this and, and try to figure out what happened because part of what we saw was we saw a lot of death of traditional bookstores that could carry weird titles. We yeah. saw um, by the nineties, the places where you would buy comic books no longer had it, which were mostly drugstores, gas stations, yep. supermarkets. Exactly. Um, and all you're left with are these boutique stores that all they sell is comics, which they had to know if you don't have a place for normies to get interested in comics, there's no yeah. reason for anyone to ever step in a comic book shop. You know, they get hooked on Spider-Man that they got yeah. at uh, 7-Eleven, and then they want more. Exactly. The problem is, like you said, there's no more introduction. Like yourself, mm -hmm. I got introduced to comics through the local drugstore. Yep. And because, and I picked up books because 
oh, I recognize these characters from the Super Friends. I'd see the old Spider-Man cartoon. I'd see the old Marvel Iron Man and Thor. And then I, then I kind of figured out later, oh, these came first. Oh, yeah, the yeah. comics came first. Okay, cool. Um, you know, I think for comic book shop owners, I think they, they were really stuck, you know, mm -hmm. because there's there was no entry into the into the books. You know, the books are priced so that folks like us who who are willing to pay, you know, the higher the higher end price for mm -hmm. a higher end qu quality, you know, it's a very niche market, you know, as opposed yeah. to like manga is made for everybody. And everybody in Japan reads it. You know, oh, yeah. you have you have a small you have a small island that does that you know does multiples in comics compared to what what this nation does. Oh, you know, it's not only is it everywhere; it's accepted that adults will read manga. Um, they have whole manga cafes where the whole scheme is: you go in and they're making money on the drinks, but there's a whole library of content that like every weird genre you can think of yeah. is there. And, uh, you know, a lot of these places, people will actually stay overnight, especially in the bigger cities. Yeah. You know, where is anything like that here? The only thing I've seen somewhat similar is pre-COVID uh, in, in Southern California, you start to see gaming cafes where mm -hmm. you go in, they would have a ton of games on the shelves. You have to order something, but then you take a game and you play with it i would like to see something you know like something especially around college towns that would be perfect like you go in you can pick out whatever comic and read it and but sadly we do not live in those times anymore no, i know the the world has changed dramatically and we don't know what it's gonna kind of go back to you know what it's gonna look like but i'll tell you the i'll tell you one thing that has worked for for good Mm -hmm. is that it's opened up opportunities for folks like yourself that have that have shows because these shows now become the lifeline for how books get sold you know wow. i mean this is this is how it gets done i mean it's like the community is completely democratized now it's like you know if you have a show mm -hmm. you're an important part of the community if you're if you're retweeting stuff and you're you know sharing stuff you're an important part of the community that it was never like anything like this before. no no it's yeah i mean that's i don't know i have i have mixed feelings about it in certain ways um but it i think due to the failure especially of the big two and even of the smaller companies image vault you know a lot of them really dropped the ball because they never had very good um customer service or customer interaction i guess you'd say no maybe at cons or something but they never really well except for a few people they never really took the opportunity to get involved with customers that's um, right so i i think almost out of necessity things like this started to pop up and especially when, when you get into the you look at the comic book uh, media like the news reporting sites where you know, they give everything a glowing review. You know, the lowest score they'll give is like an eight out of ten. And you're looking at that book and it's like, nah, nah, not nah, even. Nah. That see, but that's the challenge. You know, that's it's, it's kind of like the the same thing that ratings agencies face with businesses. You know, if the business is paying the rating agency to give the rating, yeah. Come on now. You know, we and, and it's kind of like these, you know, these entities that are doing that are doing the ratings also want to be in the good graces of the companies. Right. You know, and you can't have it both ways. You know, we really need, we really need independent third parties, you know, if they're going to be doing reviews, cause I don't trust those reviews. I don't, I stopped reading those reviews. Cause like I, how many times have I, have I read a review in the past and then picked up the book and I'm like, wow, this is trash. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. You know, I'm like, I'm like, oh, like, this was garbage. And this person talked about this book like it was the best thing, you know, since sliced bread. So if you don't mind switching gears a little bit, ever since I read Black Tiger, I I've got a few questions about you. So uh, number one, you're a Kung Fu guy, right? Oh, I love it. D have you practiced it? So I've practiced a couple different forms. Uh, one is uh, 
practiced uh, was Sansu. Oh, okay. Which, which is a very, which was a very uh, aggressive form of kung fu. And then uh, another form is actually uh, Fu Jai Pao, and that mm -hmm. is um, my my Sifu. After I actually, this is this is subsequent to reading to to writing about Black Tiger. Is is one of the styles that Black Tiger Kung Fu comes from. Oh, interesting. So there is so there is a whole, and this is a whole thing that I'm going to un, un, unleash. I I uh, got to interview kind of the uh, uh, the the Grand Master um, Sifu, and basically it was a Kung Fu art that was lost in China, oh. and it may have been lost. Mm, I don't want to say it was during the Cultural Revolution, but it was lost. In China, and um, it's actually it's it exists here in the in the states, and they're looking to reintroduce it to China. Oh, and there's there's a whole amazing story um, that goes along with that. And I, you know, I've I've gotten you know some of the blessings from some of the seafoods to, you know, a do a, kind of a riff of that in the story. But I think also I'm gonna end up doing like some kind of a documentary work. Just because I think I find it so fascinating. Oh, very cool. You know, the the things that are going on and just how basically someone had to like it was like it was like a it was like a Sifu's um servant that mm -hmm. ended up escaping with the with the Kung Fu system. Oh wow. And coming to the United States and keeping that system alive. That sounds interesting. Yeah. I buy that story. Yeah. And that's real. That's <laughs> probably better than anything I wrote. You know, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Because I was reading that, so I, I lived in Beijing for four years, and uh, I studied kung fu while I was there, and I I teach on occasion and lecture uh, in in a few different countries about nice. some parts of it. And I was reading that book, and I was just thinking to myself, like, okay, this guy knows too much to be a casual. He, <laughs> he has to be involved in it some way. Like, I, I know there's some pictures of him in silk pajamas somewhere. You know it. <laughs> you know it. <laughs> uh, so, and then I have another question. Uh, you know, I'm sorry. I couldn't, I was going to reread the book this morning and I couldn't find it. I forget the names, but the, the sister who's the main character. Yes. Jin. Jin. Yes. Yes. So she has that white boyfriend mm -hmm. who, um, <laughs> who he keeps telling her that the Japanese student, it, he's just helping her out. Like, okay, so that whole backstory, that's real, right? You that had to have happened, didn't it? Yeah, that 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 was actually from a, a buddy of mine's ah, uh, I knew it. a buddy of mine's sister. <laughs> <laughs> I that because it, it was too good not to be. <laughs> that was yeah, man. I read that and it's like, oh man, I know so many people who that could be. Like, yeah, just it had to be real. It was it was too too specific, too detailed, too on the nose to not be real. Yeah, that one was. And sometimes, you know, fact is stranger stranger than fiction. Yes. You know, I've got like I've got some other stories that are coming out, mm -hmm. and the best parts of the story are just because it's unbelievable what 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 people actually do. You yeah. know, and you're just like, man, and people are like, hey, that was great. I'm like, yeah, actually, I didn't make that up. <laughs> <laughs> and my favorite part of the story is when, the, yeah, I didn't make that up actually. <laughs> well, you know, you, you might not have made it up out of whole cloth, but you know, you had to have the skill to tell it in a way that's interesting. No, I appreciate that. Tell it in a way that you know people believe it, as opposed to like, oh, come on, that would never happen. Right, right. And I mean, it's it's just one of those things where, you know, as human beings, um, you know we all have our insecurities, you know, we all have, and he's got a story in and of himself as well. Mm -hmm. You know? So, I mean, it's, it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm, I've, I told, I tell a little bit more about his story in the next coming volume because Jen still, uh, after all of that, she's still attracted to the dude, you know? Ooh, okay. um, and I'm not saying that he's good for her, but, He's got real baggage too, you know, and that's kind of the human story. You know, things happen yeah. and people do stuff, and sometimes we'll see one dimension of it. We're like, what he did sucked. Yeah, it did suck, you know, but his uh, his life hasn't been a bed of roses either. 
Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting because to me, stuff like that makes it more interesting when it's like when things are are too fantasy and everything is unbelievable. Uh, I just can't relate to it as much. But when you can like ground it in certain moments like that, where it's yeah. like, oh yeah, I know that guy, or you know the girl, or you yeah. know, you know, then then it brings me. Even, even though in some ways it does make me think of <laughs> my own life experiences, it does suck me back into the story, um, not letting me disconnect from it. Yeah. And I think one of the things you'll see with Jen is mm -hmm. while she's very accomplished, she has she definitely has uh, some some pretty heavy insecurities. And it's all part it all plays into the story. You know, and it's what, it, what it's what makes it's what makes her who she is. And some of these things are things that she will uh, overcome. And some of these things are just going to be part of her struggle, mm -hmm. you know, and that's kind of where we all live. Right. I mean, we, exactly. we, we want to, we want to be able to be, you know, heroes in our own narrative, but that doesn't mean that we've perfected living. It doesn't mean that we've gotten over all of our own stuff. You know, sometimes you got to just kind of white knuckle it through your own stuff and be a hero in spite of your own stuff. And, and that's kind of where she is. It was funny because, um, you know, even even as my, my wife, and she's been an amazing editor for me on the story, he was, she was just like, man, you know, so, you know, is the objective for, for her to overcome all of these different shortcomings in her life? I'm like, no, the object, I mean, she's a, she's a person mm -hmm. and she's, and, and she is dealing with being a hero as well as, as well as being a professional. You know, there's some things that she's going to grow and develop with regards to. And there's some things that she's just, she will continue to struggle with, but she's going to have to find a way to live. <laughs> yeah. You know, she can still be a hero and do that. And I think that's one of the things, and, and that, that doesn't diminish her as a person. It doesn't diminish her as a woman. You know, I think that's one of the challenges that we've seen mm -hmm. um, even, uh, even with some of these movements. Now it's like, okay, well, you can't, portray weakness in certain people at all anymore. Exactly. And when you can't do that, you take away their humanity. You know, and that's the thing. If you look back in history, what made Marvel take off and have their sales ahead of DC for so many years, starting in the 60s? Well, because Spider-Man was a nerd who couldn't get a girlfriend, and he had dandruff. Yeah. You know, uh, ben Grimm uh, felt really bad he couldn't get close to people. Again, yeah. women too, uh, because he was a big rock. That's right. You know, and all of these traditional Silver Age characters had flaws. They had things that people could relate to. And if you couldn't relate to this one, well, there's another one that has something that you could relate to. That's right. Uh, and yeah, you're absolutely right. This is, to me, one of the biggest problems with, um, especially Marvel, is the characters are just so bland and they don't have to work to overcome anything. Oh, I hate that. And it's just so boring. Well, it makes it makes the stories boring. You know, yeah. even when I look at some of the movies that were, you know, that have been released as of late, um, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty, when it comes to like my movies and stuff, you know, just entertain me. I'm not going to be like an uber critic. Mm -hmm. You know, like when I watched, when I watched Mulan, you know, I, I enjoyed it. You know, I enjoyed the movie. You know, I mean, one of the things that I found really kind of tough, especially as a dad and just as somebody, it's just like, you know, you have this little girl and she's just doing this masterful, you know, 10th level Kung Fu just out uh -huh. the box. I'm like, I didn't like that because, you know, I liked in the cartoon version, you know, yeah, she built herself up to be that. Exactly. Because that's what humanity is. You know, you build yourself up to a level of competence. You, mastery is not easy. Mastery, in fact, is boring, you know? But when we tell people you can be a master of something just by waking up and participating, that's that's just sucky. You know, I, that doesn't resonate. That doesn't resonate with me at all because there's nothing good in my life that that has been achieved, that has been easy for me. So mm -hmm. I'm, when, that, when you can just wake up and be a Kung Fu master, you lose me. It Exactly. And two, what what message does that send? Because, you know, she was, I guess, born this Kung Fu master and her sister like 
oh, well, sorry, you were just born to be a guy's wife. You know, like that's the message you're given to the daughters is if we're only born a certain way, like you're either at the top or you're going to be at the bottom, yeah. no matter what you do. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just, I don't know. And I don't know, man, I, 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 I'm, I'm really challenged by that stuff and I'm really challenged by what the industry kind of, and I mean like, uh, you know, on, on a higher level is, is trying to do. And I'm like, look, you're not protecting people by making people seem invincible. Mm-hmm. You're not protecting people by making, you know, it's like, hey, you know, this person can do exactly what that person could do. No, they can't, but that's okay. Yeah, it's, exactly. it's okay. I've got two sons and I've got a daughter and they're very, and they're all very different, you know, and, and they're all very special and they're all very awesome. Mm-hmm. And one isn't less than the other. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and, and trying to, trying to say like, okay, well, these, these female qualities, whatever, you know what? No, you can do everything that a boy can do, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, and, and boys who do everything that girls, it's, it's not true. <laughs> you know, I've, I got, I got three kids that, you know, and they, they play sports and, you know, well, I, I think it's just not, just not true. <laughs> yeah. And I think too, the lesson of, of the cartoon was that Mulan, she kind of, could do everything the guys could do, but she had to do it in a different way. Right. You know, she had to use her other abilities to make up for a lack of physical strength. And that I like. Yes. That I like, you know, but I still think you got to put in work to do it though. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in going back to uh, Magna for a second, Mm-hmm. Um, so I noticed too that you have uh, the Magna Digital. That's right, and uh, you have several. Let's see, three paperback covers, right? That's correct. Yes. Uh, so what's what's your feelings on digital versus physical copies? There's a lot of people who say, "Oh no, you shouldn't sell uh, PDFs because you know people are just going to steal them," or or even some people just say, oh, I know it's not right. Comics need to be on paper. Uh, what's your feeling about that? At the end of the day, I mean, you can see, you know, for some folks, like folks that are international, it's, it, was, mm-hmm. it was just too expensive to get the sure. books into their hands. And the other thing we got to keep in mind is, you know, we kind of have our own old school mentality. Personally, mm-hmm. I like the books. I like the feel of books. That's how I prefer to read my comics. Yes. But we also want to make sure that the younger generation comes in. Mm-hmm. And my kids do everything electronically. Mm. They do everything. I mean, you know, things that they read for school, it's all on a tablet. They do everything that way. Mm-hmm. I don't like it, but that's not me. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I mean, my thought process is if we want uh, to enable, you know, especially youth and folks that are international for whom it may be more difficult for them to be able to get their hands on the books, Mm -hmm. you know, we need to have a digital solution for folks. Um, So I'm going to, I'm going to deliver the digital books through my website, through a web reader. But you know Uh what, at the end of the day, if somebody really wants to pirate it, they can, you can, you can take screenshots of your screen, right? Uh I mean, someone can scan the book. Yeah. If they, you know, so, I mean, there is no way to stop somebody that is intent upon pirating it on honestly right. from pirating it. But I think there are enough people, especially in our community that not only want good content, but want to support good content. So it can continue to, to proliferate that, mm-hmm. that I I'm okay having a digital option, you know, and letting those that, that want, to have access to the digital option to do so. I know, I know John Malin hates the digital option and he's, <laughs> he's got, he's got way more people that buy his books than mine. So, so take my advice, you know, for as much as you paid for it, that's probably as, as valuable as it is. <laughs> but, 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 uh, and, and I wonder if there's a certain crossover point, like you're right. Like, uh, you know, I've, I've happened on sites where, you know, you can find downloads to, every version of X-Men or Avengers that I've ever been. Well, there yeah. certainly weren't digital options back in the seventies. That's right. So somebody scanned them at some point. That's um, right. 
but I'm wondering too, even if you look at like the history of music, uh, Metallica, they used to encourage their fans to record their concerts live. And you used to see people with professional grade recording equipment just standing there with microphones. And then they would swap cassettes of it. Um, now, this is way before the Napster day when they wanted to cut down on everybody sharing their music. Right. But, you know, that was one of the things that built them to prominence. So I'm wondering, you know, even if there's a difference for guys who had uh, longer and perhaps more successful careers in the industry, like a John Malin or an Ethan Van Skyver, where for them, it's probably not worth the digital. But I wonder if right. for a lot of the new people coming in, like you got to get your work out there. Exactly. And then maybe at a certain point, you would you would cut it down or cut it off. Or, or I wonder even if there's like an intermediate area where the um, – the digital version is not the same as the paper version. Like the paper mm. version should come with more bonuses. Right. Right. You know? So yeah, that's actually an option, right? There's different ways to potentially do that, you True. know? And I think you have to look at the customers too. You know, a customer who today couldn't necessarily afford $25 for a book next year they might be someone who can and they might want that physical copy that's right so, but if they never read your digital copy why are they gonna spend money on the other one later exactly and for people like me i think the bigger the bigger challenge is just getting eyeballs yeah you know it's like you know if you scroll up there i think i got 151 151 or something people you know that's not a lot of people man <laughs> you know I, I don't, I, backers. you know it's like Piracy isn't my challenge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, getting people to see the book. That's, that's my challenge. But yeah. you're right. I guess it depends on where you're at. I guess if you're EDS and you're you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars, mm -hmm. you know, per campaign, then yeah, that I could see how that could be different. But I, I would still argue though, it seems like there would there would be a legitimate group of people out there who would want digital access that you would somehow, somehow you'd want to be able to service them. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, and there, there might even be certain people who maybe they did buy the physical copy, but they also want that digital for more ease of travel. Like if you're on a plane a lot or, you know, mm -hmm. people are going here and there for work and stuff. Um, yeah. You know, or even uh, for class classes, if you're teaching, you know, you might want to use it as an example. It's a lot easier to do it for from a PDF, you know. And I would rather have a good official quality version, yeah, um, rather than just you know scanning it or whatever myself. I agree. Same, same here. Same here. And I think if somebody if somebody catches a hold of a project and they're really interested in it. I think they'll, you know, I think you'll, they'll flip into a customer. They'll Absolutely. be somebody, you know, I'd actually want to get this book. I want to get a better version. Of it. I want to get a better quality version of this. Yeah. And I, and I think too, um, you know, it's like you're saying people want to support you. I think that once they sort of get to see it and say like, okay, this is something that's worth me supporting, you know, then in the end they want to, but I think a lot of people don't like to just, oh, here's, five bucks here's 10 bucks for it they want to feel like you know they're they're giving you a sale as opposed to giving you a handout no i agree with you i agree with you and i think people you know they want to be um they either want they want to be drawn into something yeah. you know and you know it's like especially if you find a book and you think it's cool and it's hey this is a new book i, I think i think that people will be willing to give it a shot absolutely all right, so uh, what else should we know about Magna, The Last Pantheon? Um, so you guys know that the book is produced. The second volume is already produced. So um, especially since you already have Black Tiger, just to give you kind mm -hmm. of a heads up on kind of what we're looking to do from a production standpoint. So we're looking to, you know, this campaign ends in 14 days. Mm -hmm. And with that, um, we... 
we almost have the file ready for the printer already. So by the time the 14 days are up, we'll have the file ready, printer ready. We'll go ahead, we'll, we'll um, go to printing, and then we'll start shipping out the books, get those out by, uh, by the latter part of Q1, and then mm -hmm. we're going to release the next Black Tiger um, oh, nice. campaign. Um, it's not going to be 172 pages, so I'm going to start doing a little bit smaller volume so I can start turning them around faster. But that production is complete as well. Wow. So, so the intention is to turn that around and get that into people's hands by the end of Q2. And then for Q3, since production is already done on the next volume of Magna, do that campaign. So the intent is to see if we can get a little bit of a machine going mm -hmm. where people can feel like, hey, I'm going to get something cool. You know, I don't know if we can do it quarterly, but I'd love to be able to do it on a quarterly basis. Where, hey, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get a, you know, a new volume of Magnum. I'm gonna get a new volume of Black Tiger, um, and hopefully, you know, because we're, we're all trying to see what this is gonna look like, what this industry is, you know, what this new revel kind of, kind of revolution or, or mm -hmm. uh, you know, of the of of comics is gonna look like, and that's kind of what I'm playing with now. So. Uh -huh. If I get enough traction to do that, then my intention is just to keep production, to keep ahead of production enough where I can keep putting out the books. And by the time we get to a campaign, the campaign is already produced. People can look at it, watch the video, hopefully back it, and hopefully more people will join and people that have backed will continue to back. <laughs> oh, awesome. Uh, you know, I, I forgot about one thing. I was looking around on the campaign uh, before we started talking today. and. Did I, I did see that there was an animatic of this, right? Yes. So um, Rod Looper, who was the uh, artist for Black Tiger, mm -hmm. he and I, uh, we put together a 10 minute animatic for Magna. Um, so if you go to uh, Beyond Time Inc, our, the YouTube page, you'll find a 10 minute animatic of Magna. Um, it's, it's, it was quite an undertaking, but we we were really fortunate. We got some great voice actors, uh -huh. um, a couple of buddies of mine that uh, laid down the music uh, for the animatic. And I'll, I'll tell you honestly, at some point, I would like to be able to complete that animatic and turn mm -hmm. it into an animation. You know, so wow. I mean, we were kind of playing around with what would it look like to be able to take one of these properties and start to move it towards having you know having an animated product. And I think that I think that as an industry, we're all going to mm -hmm. eventually get there. Um, I think I'll, I think it's still a little bit premature because we don't have the fan base for it yet. Sure. But I would love for people to go check it out. Um, you know, it, I'm 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 proud of that. Um, there's that there, and the other thing that you'll find um, on our YouTube page, you have to scroll down for it. In 2014, we made a um, a, a short. It was basically mm -hmm. a Comic Con special. A short for Black Tiger, and it won the Spirit of Comic Con award. And it starred uh, Robin Shu, who was the original oh, wow. Liu Kang, and had Angela Fong, who was a WWE diva. And we did a twenty-minute, a twenty-minute Black Tiger short film. Um, so go go check that out there. It's it's uh, it's on the YouTube as well. Oh, I'm definitely gonna check that out. Yeah, yeah. So just trying to you know really trying to uh, produce content. Uh, just trying to you know, a little bit of a, some of it's a little bit of experimental kind of like the film and, and the animatic. Um, but I get a feeling that at some point, those are things that comic book creators will be able to bring to the table themselves. Uh, because I think that's the only way to get things done in a way that is going to be true to the content. That's going to be true to the source material. Yeah. And it's interesting. I was, I had uh, Doug Ernst on last year and he was telling me, you could get a 30 minute cartoon for i can't remember exactly what he said if it was either 30,000 or 60,000 which it sounds like a lot but that's really not that much for that's me. not that much um and then it seems to me that they're well especially if we continue into play years when everybody's forced to stay home and watch watch more content on TV than we'd probably like yeah. um, it seems like you know Netflix and Amazon Prime and I don't know about Crunchyroll and those, but it seems like there's going to be uh, a, a larger market for more independent animation coming up soon. Yeah. 
I think so. And I think, I think it's going to be, this will be one of the areas that they mine Mm -hmm. uh, to try and find it. You know, my, my main thing is I really hope that the independent animation remains independent, Um, you know, as opposed to, Oh, you know, it's kind of the traditional, you get a deal and then, you know, cause that, that just doesn't, that just, that doesn't end up well. And especially kind of the powers that be that are kind of running these organizations Mm -hmm. that, that won't work out well. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it kind of makes me wonder, sort of like we're talking about with the comic, you know, you should have a large part produced ahead of time. It makes me wonder if people, you know, produce, let's say three out of 10 episodes on their own. Mm -hmm. Will that give them a lot more leverage when it comes to these, you know, these international companies? It would make sense. And then it's like, hey, just kind of give, you know, you kind of earn the right to say, hey, all we need is the budget. Yep. You know, and, and let us run. And the great thing now is like so many, so many shows have short runs. I mean, it's like getting financing for eight episodes. Yeah, yeah. You know, do a, do an eight episode run. You got to figure somebody like a John Malin or an EBS. I mean, they already have the backing. They could they could raise that sixty grand. You oh. know, I'm mean, just like, hey, you know, going to do a graveyard shift animation. You know, heck yeah, oh. I can contrib- I contributed that in a second. Yeah, it would sell like hotcakes. Um, yeah. In the in the Dungeons and Dragons world, there's a show called Critical Role, which is mm-hmm. basically you're just watching people play D and D. And they finished a whole season that I think took like two, three years. But their their main jobs are voice actors. So they said, hey, we want to crowdfund this. And they ended up, I think they wanted like $60,000 to make like an episode. But they ended up with like $11 million. What? <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so I think that there's, you know, part of it was uh, a bit of a cult of personality thing. Um, but I think that they could absolutely, um, you know, be on the forefront of a trend where a lot of these independent stories that people like that haven't been changed and perverted with notes from producers and whatnot, um, you know, they really have a chance to succeed in the future, I think. I think so. And I think we're really seeing the revolution of the, of this, of this whole industry, you know, because if you can do that, if you can, if you can, you know, basically raise the capital to do that, then mm-hmm. it's like, you're, you're really not, you're really not stuck in terms of distribution. Right. <laughs> you know, if you want to, mm-hmm. you can, mm-hmm. you can distribute it on YouTube. Absolutely. You can distribute it on your own channel. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely seems like it's, it's, you know, one of the things that I like about independent comics is it unlike uh, when you had issues like, Gamergate or some of these issues in, in like TV and movies, um, you can make your own comic yourself. It's absolutely possible. And it seems like the cost of animation is almost getting to that point. So if you don't like what mainstream is doing, we're almost to the point where you could say, ah, screw it. I'll do it myself. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's going to be the revolution. And I'll tell you, man, if that's where things go, then YouTube's are even a lot smarter than I thought, you know, <laughs> because no, can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, we're, you know, we're already supporting each other's comics and we're making comics. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? I mean, honestly, I would love to be able to make animation. I think, I'd, I think, especially for these projects, I'd rather see them animated than, than live action. Yeah, for sure. For a lot of these projects. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I always hate uh, those Japanese, like, uh, what was it? Um, uh, I can't think of the name. The Full Metal, Full Metal Alchemist. Mm-hmm. Like the live action was just like, oh god. Oh, yeah. Cartoons are fantastic, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. Well, it is a Saturday, and I don't want to keep you too much longer. Um, any last words for Magna? Um, yeah, just check it out. It's a, it's a fun. For those of you that haven't, it is a fun supernatural adventure. Uh, it's going to take you all over the place, um, and uh, it has a story that I believe will hook you. You'll you'll uh, you'll enjoy the ride. All right. Well, John Hervey, thanks a lot for coming by and talking about Magna and Black Tiger, and everyone else. 
please uh, like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you back soon.